I am Dylan Siegler, Program Director for Chicago Careers in Public and Social Service. Uh, my program works with students interested in careers in politics, government, policy, nonprofit, the broad spectrum. We're really excited to have a great government panel here for you today. And I first wanted to acknowledge the three student coordinators who were very helpful in making this whole thing happen, both for the panelists and then for the lunch roundtable. So Sally O'Brien is there, and Andrea McPike, and Charlie Kargman. So we're really glad. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. And um, the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Flynn Curry, who's gonna moderate the panel, and we're gonna do panel introductions, and then um, have a few questions for the panelists, but we definitely want you guys to ask questions as well, okay? And so there are microphones there. It's not too big a room, so you'll be able to ask questions, but make us proud, show your good questions, and uh, well, uh, we're excited. Barbara, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Dylan, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm, in fact, the state representative who represents the University of Chicago, at least the main campus. So even if you're not registered in the state of Illinois to vote, and I certainly hope that you are, what I do in Springfield makes a difference to the quality of your life right on the south side of the city of Chicago. I've been in the legislature for quite some time. I am today the majority leader, and in fact, Andrew McPike's father preceded me as majority leader in the Illinois House of Representatives. So we are a group of people with very different kinds of careers in government, and I'm going to just introduce very briefly the panel. I'm gonna do it in the order in which they appear in your program, even though they didn't choose to seat themselves that way. I think that may have something to do with the kind of education you get at the University <laughs> of Chicago, but I'm not sure. So Will Burns, who is, at, and after I introduce them briefly, they are each gonna kinda introduce themselves, but we're not going to let them pretend that they are in a lecture hall and that they are your professor. They're going to be brief. So Will Burns is a, a, a University of Chicago graduate from 1995, and he did a lot of work in the Illinois State Senate. Ultimately, he was the deputy chief of staff to the then Senate president, and one of the people that he worked with most closely was the person who today is the president of the United States, Barack Obama. Will was working in the Senate when Barack was a state senator. Now, Will has moved on, he moved on himself to the Illinois House of Representatives where he was briefly my colleague, I think for two terms. And then he made, I think, a very interesting career switch. He moved to the Chicago City Council. Now some people might think that actually there's more prestige and power in going from a city council to a state legislature, even to Capitol Hill, but in Chicago, our political culture says the other way really is better. Now I have to point out that when you're the alderman, you don't get to deal with very important issues of state, you get to deal a lot in potholes and stop signs. But Will is doing an excellent job, and I, I, I certainly applaud his decision to make the switch, and I'm sure you'll have lots of good questions for him. Uh, he's also, of course, the alderman in the fourth ward, which is partly covering the University of Chicago, so if there are any potholes on your block, <laughs> you'll, know, you'll know the chap to see. Next, again, in order of the, uh, the program, is Rico Gardefe. Rico is the person who is going to be responsible for the message that re-elects Barack Obama. He started out as a, still a college student working in then-Senator Barack Obama's office, switched to the campaign where he dealt with constituent issues and so forth and so on. He did actually do some field work, some groundwork in some of the early primary and general election states, but he went after the election, after the inauguration, he went to the White House where he has served as one of the chief message people. So people write to the president, it's Rico who gets to figure out how to answer them. And as we all know, in politics, the message is the message. And without Rico, there's not a chance Barack would make it in 2012. The third, the third panelist, and I think he's gonna suck up all the oxygen in the room. <laughs> the third panelist is Philip Giraldi, and he uh, spent a lot of time in counterterrorism in the CIA. He also speaks five different languages, no, sorry, only Spanish, Italian, German, and Turkish, so those of you who are more interested in your language skills may have a lot of questions for him on that front. But his work as a uh, member of the CIA counterterrorism specialist and military intelligence officer, he spent 19 years overseas, Turkey, Italy, 
Germany, Spain, and when the Barcelona Olympics happened, he was the CIA chief, base chief, right on the ground. Since then, he's moved on to a not-for-profit activity. He's uh, the head of the executive director of the Council for the National Interest, which is a Washington-based advocacy group that is concerned particularly about how policies and programs in the Middle East work with, connect to American values and American needs. And the final panel is Erin Sweeney. Erin, she's the other one who's likely to get all the questions, honestly. She's a Foreign Service Officer with the Department of State. Uh, she right now is at the New York Passport Agency in New York City, but she has been Political Officer in La Paz, Bolivia, a con Consular Officer in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, she's a Thomas Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellow. She's had internships and temporary assignments in Berlin and uh, Tanzania. Uh, she's received the Secretary, uh, Secretary of State's Award for Overseas Volunteerism. She graduated from the U of C in 2005 and then went on to do public policy work at the Kennedy School. So these are who they are, and if each of you want to add to what I said, now's your chance. Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, that is deafening. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> So Tony Preckwinkle was the alderman of the Fourth Ward for about 20 years before I became the alderman. And whenever she spoke to any group, she always said good morning or good afternoon. As a former teacher, if she didn't get a response, she asked again. I want to thank all of you for, for joining us. And, and, and um, I want to thank my former leader and still leader, uh, Barbara Flynn Curry, for moderating the panel. Uh, there are a couple things I want to say. Is, one is that um, the, the great thing about politics and government in Chicago and in Illinois is that it is not as parochial as is presented. Um, there's a tremendous openness to people who have great ideas and great energy and are willing to follow through on the duties uh, that are assigned to them. I mean, case in point, I am not from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I grew up, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I went to University of Chicago, that's how I got to Chicago. And I volunteered for people. I volunteered for Barack Obama when he was running for state senator in 1995-96. And through a series of um, jobs, uh, which at the time didn't seem very line linearly related, uh, I ended up in the Chicago City Council. Now, one thing I will say about city government versus other units of government is that really the buck stops with us. Um, when I walk literally, out, literally, 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 the buck stops with us. When, when I walk outside of my house, um, I'm lobbied by my constituents. If I'm at the grocery store, I'm lobbied by my constituents. If I'm at the gym jumping rope literally at 6 o'clock in the morning, I get to answer questions about what's happening in the ward. The, the upshot of that, though, is that you are really responsible for making sure that what people want occurs. Uh, are we going to develop our commercial corridors to have the kind of retail that people are looking for? Uh, are we how do we improve our neighborhood public schools so that people want to send their children to them? How do we make sure that the police are um, being aggressive and taking care of crime issues while at the same time respecting civil liberties and, uh, and the rest? And you do it in a very complex area. The, the fourth ward is one of the most diver div diverse wards in the city of Chicago. And in many cases, I feel like I negotiate peace treaties between residents on one block and a commercial property owner uh, across the street from them on how long their uh, operation is going to run and, and sort of these uh, kinds of issues. I've had a great time because the feedback is immediate. Um, when I do something that people like and they recognize and they've wanted, people tell me. Um, and so I literally feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives every day. So I encourage you to think about city government even though I've got folks from the State Department and the CIA sitting to my right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Will. And Rico, let's turn to you. Uh, I don't really have anything to add to my bio. Uh, I just kind of wanted to say at the beginning that I think I share uh, um, Barbara's sentiment that we hope this is as informative and useful for you as it possibly can be. You're going to attend panels like this for the rest of your career, and you're always going to hear the same advice, network, stay in touch, do a good job, those kinds of things. I want to be as useful about defining what that means for you um, as opposed to just saying something that we all kind of nod to and you guys don't understand what we're talking about. So uh, if there's any very case where I'm answering a question like that, uh, please stop me. I think this should be, um, as long as I am have the mic, uh, informal as possible. So 
uh, I just want to be helpful. Okay, but Rico, what is the message you were supposed to tell us? Oh that. well, I should correct the record at first. As a federal employee, uh, I hope I'm that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I hope Oops. that um, the good work we do in the Obama administration uh, encourages enough people to support him again. However, uh, that's not your job. That's I'm not my I job. really misspoke, and yeah, I, and no, I do fine. apologize. Yeah, you're, if you if you pursue a, a career in government, you're going to learn about the bright line that is often hard to always see, which is strange, between politics and government. Uh, and having served on both sides of those for uh, Senator Obama and President Obama, um, it's probably one of the greatest challenges uh, about navigating a successful career and staying out of trouble. Uh, so I just always want to make sure that we're clear on that. Thank you, Rico. Phil? Well, I'm a Ron Paul supporter, actually. So. <laughs> um, I, I would appreciate it if nobody asked me anything in Turkish. <laughs> it's, it's been a long time, and I've lost a lot of it. But anyway, um, my bio is basically as it is on the paper. The um, I, I think if you're if you're seriously thinking about a career in intelligence, there are a few things you should be considering. Um, the hardest part about uh, working for a CIA or any of the other intelligence agencies is getting in through the door. Uh, there are 200 applicants for every job, and apparently those numbers are even going down now. So that's um, it's a serious issue. Uh, what was I what I was suggesting to the people I had lunch with today was that essentially you have to you have to look at your resume and figure out how your resume might be, um, shall we say, emphasized to 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 show different skills in terms of foreign languages, of experience in foreign cultures, uh, that sort of thing that would catch the attention of a CIA recruiter. Um, if, if you're interested in being an analyst, obviously there should be specific academic skills. And University of Chicago people are all over the intelligence community uh, because of our um, proven ability to uh, provide critical analysis of serious and complicated issues. Um, the other thing you should be thinking about is your ability to get a security clearance. The, the profile that gets you in the door, sort of, is what keeps you out with the security clearance. Because if it, if, if it is determined that you have uh, too close an affinity to a foreign culture or a foreign country or have family or anything there, it's going to make it very difficult for you to get a security clearance. So these are just the realities you have to be dealing with. Um, the, um, the third thing I, I, that I'll just mention very briefly is that obviously intelligence is not the same as working in a, in a normal job. National security is a very important thing, and just how you relate to it really depends on what your view of the world is and what your view of, of the developments over the past 10 years have been. Um, I would say specifically that if you're interested in intelligence in its current formulation, you should be thinking in terms of the, of the ethical, uh, potential ethical, moral dilemmas, um, uh, particularly I'm thinking in terms of the use of drones and drone warfare which many people, including myself, would consider to be war crimes. Uh, so this is something you have, to, you have to seriously consider. Even if you're a Russian analyst going into the CIA, uh, one third of the CIA budget right now is related to drones and drone activity. So you're gonna wind up doing that stuff even if it's not really what you signed up for. So um, I would say you know, there, there's a lot of thinking to do before even starting the process of, of trying to get into the intelligence community. Uh, I'll be around after this today, if anybody is seriously interested in talking about tactics and maybe ways of working the system, uh, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you very much, Phil. Erin, may we hear from you? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, it's, it's always so nice to be back here. I, I love being back around University of Chicago mm -hmm. students. It brings back so many great memories, so I'm so glad to be back here with you guys. I, I want to just say up front, too, and that... Um, when we get to the question and answer period, I know people who are interested in the Foreign Service tend to have very specific Foreign Service related questions, like questions about the test and things like that. And uh, I want to make sure that this panel sees for everybody. So if you do have very specific questions about the Foreign Service, the test process, all those sorts of things, please do email me or see me after, and we can talk about that offline. Um, the, again, there's nothing really I want to add from my, from my bio either, uh, except that I, I do want to mention a few key items that I've learned through the process of working with the federal government over the last couple of years, and just in general, some, some things that I've picked up over the years. One thing um, that is really important for the Foreign Service is uh, what they're going to be looking at when you do take the test, is how you're spending your free time. 
How do you spend your summers while you're in college? They're going to want to see that almost every summer you did something. You did an internship. You traveled abroad. You did something interesting with your time that you didn't just spend the summer at the beach. Um, they want to see that you're using a good advantage of your, of your summers doing good quality internships. They're going to look at the extracurricular activities you did while you were in college, especially if you're applying straight from college. That's what they, they're basing your admins based on your experiences. And so this is important, what you're doing with your free time. And when you do the test or you're applying for certain jobs, and I think this probably applies for other jobs, not just the Foreign Service, but draw on those experiences you've had. You may think that something you did in high school was so far away and so long ago that it's not relevant, but if you're coming straight out of college, I used something I did in high school in the Foreign Service test and was told by my testers later that was my strongest example and was the reason that I, that I passed the test. So don't be afraid to draw on things that are good examples from your life. Um, you know, using different examples from college, different activities you've done. Have a breadth of experience. Don't try to reuse too many of the same examples when you're taking things like the Foreign Service test or applying to grad school or different things you might be doing, but have that breadth of experience that you can draw on and be, be ready to give solid examples of leadership experiences, of cross-cultural experiences. Some of the things that he was talking about, languages are so big if you want to get into the Foreign Service or any international policy and international NGOs, they're going to be looking for those sorts of things and, and study abroad, those kinds of experiences. So be sure that you spend your time wisely while you're in college because those are important. Um, on that point, if you are able to get good internships or even if they're maybe not the internship you wanted, but it's, it's a good one for you to start building contacts. The contacts that I made in my internship in college with the State Department are my strongest contacts to this day. They are the cheerleaders for me when something's going off. When you're in the Foreign Service, you have to start bidding for positions. It's like applying for a new job every two years. And it's all based on your reputation. So if you were the intern who didn't really take it seriously, came in late, didn't dress properly, they will remember. And you know, 10 years in your career, you might be going for this job you really want. And that person remembers you. So really, really watch the contacts you make, the way you present yourself, take your internships, externships, Metcalfs, everything incredibly seriously. Even if it's not something you want to go into, things come around and you run into people later in life. So, so definitely always network. Don't burn any bridges, especially in the, in the government. And just, uh, just a comment on the Foreign Service as, as a career path. It's also something you really need to think about seriously when, you, when you're making that commitment. Um, the Foreign Service is a 24-7 job, just like being on city council. When you go overseas as a diplomat, the second you walk onto that plane with your diplomatic passport, you are on. And that's 24-7. You are a nonpartisan member of the federal government supporting whatever administration is in, is in office, whether you agree with them or not. You are constantly in front of people who will remember everything you say, you may go to a dinner with a contact that you built and you thought he was such a good contact and the next day the front page of the paper, US Embassy says this, this, this about the, the current government of the country you're in and you just made a comment. So when you join something like the Foreign Service, it's a 24-7 job. It's a job that uh, you have to take very seriously and it's not just a job, it's a lifestyle. You're choosing a lifestyle, a lifestyle of living and working with the same people all the time you have no separation of your personal life and your public life. Um, you, you choose a lifestyle of moving every two years. Some people really like that because they get bored, and that's great. But you need to be someone who likes moving every two years, who likes having a new challenge, a new job, new, new people to work for. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. But at the end of the day, government work, I think, can be incredibly rewarding, uh, especially if you get positions that you're really passionate about, areas of the world you're interested in. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over. But again, if you have specific questions, please do email me about those. Erin, that was great. And I do think that much of what she said is relevant to any of the jobs that any of us on the panel have, the, the, the business about networking and about making sure that you're not treading upon people's toes and so forth and so on. That's obviously especially important for elected officials. The only thing I would quarrel with is I don't think in order to be an Illinois state legislator, I need to learn Turkish. 
I have a question for Phil, and that is that you changed careers in, in some ways not so dramatic because your focus has always been on Middle East policies and how that relates to the United States uh, programs, uh, and you did that when you were a, a counterintelligence specialist and the military intelligence person, but now you are running, you are the executive director of a not-for-profit organization, and maybe you'd give us a little idea about how you made the transition and maybe you'd also like to tell us how the, the, the two different kinds of experiences worked for you. Well, uh, I think actually they, they relate to each other more than it seems. The, uh, the um, uh, working inside the government, I'm sure you've had the same experience, uh, basically shows you the flaws of government and the flaws of policies and why policies don't work. And uh, finally, when you're released from the uh, the bosom of the government, uh, the option is open to you, well, what am I going to do with that experience? What am I going to do with that knowledge? Uh, it seems to me that particularly in the last 10 years since I've left the government, uh, but even while I was in the government, it was very clear that the uh, uh, United States government in many countries overseas uh, does not serve the national interest, does not serve the American people. That basically it's like a machine that's running out of control that does a lot of things that it does pro forma or does for political reasons. So uh, finally, when I got freed up from this, I started writing. I started writing for uh, mostly conservative publications. The American Conservative was one that I started out with. Uh, I now write for some libertarian websites and publications. Antiwar.com is one. And uh, essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm a Ron Paul supporter. I believe that uh, government is too big. We're doing too many things. We're too ma doing too many awful things all around the world that we, we haven't really come to grips with yet. We're fighting wars we don't have to fight. So I'm very active in pushing for a foreign policy that makes sense. And that's why I'm, I'm working with a foundation now that I'm gradually nudging in that direction that we have, to, we have to essentially, as the American people are running out of money, we're running out of uh, people be, uh, that are willing to be soldiers and, and be killed in this process. And, and I think it's time for us to do a rethink about what we're doing. And, and head in another direction. So that's what remaining um, vitality in life I have left. I would like to be successful in doing that. Thank you. That's very helpful. And it seems to me what you're saying is that you, you discovered a lack of enthusiasm over the policies for which you were working, that the government stopped being the government that you had signed up to do good things for. And so you took another, uh, another, another direction, not unrelated to what you had been doing, but certainly very different in terms of the everyday experience. Now, I suspect some of you students know exactly what you want to be doing uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, and I expect some of you don't. And let me just tell you my own story. I grew up in the benighted 1950s, and in the 1950s, there were very few women who held elective public office. And to the extent that there were any, they mostly inherited the job when their husbands died. So on my to-do list, as I was a teenager and a college student, on my to-do list, the job of state representative was just plain nowhere. Things began changing as I grew older, and there was an opportunity to run for state representative in my own area. I had earlier thought it would be wonderful to run for public office in a rock-ribbed conservative area like Arizona, like Arizona so that I could teach people how they were wrong. I could educate and inform the electorate. But it never occurred to me that I would run any place where I might win. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, actually representing the people who lived in my neighborhood and with whom I had worked on all kinds of issues turned out to be a better fit. And so uh, actually when I ran into some people and there was a sudden vacancy in the Office of State Representative in our area, I ran into friends who encouraged me to run. Uh, and as I say, it had not been on my to-do list, and it was a slightly uh, surprising thought, but I did test it out. I asked my husband what he thought, and he thought it would be swell. I asked my son, an older child, who was uh, going through a fairly conservative period, and he started out by saying, gee, Mom, that would be great. Oh, wait a minute, he said, you don't believe in anything, you don't stand for anything I believe in. And then I talked to my younger, younger child, my daughter, who said, oh, that would be really, but wait a minute, she said, you know, that's a full-time job and you're a part-time person. What would you do about tennis and talking on the telephone to your friends? So <laughs> the, moral, 
moral, the moral of the story is to say that as a young woman growing up, it didn't occur to me at some point I might want to run for elective office. And I think that this fits into what Phil is saying as well, that what you start out doing doesn't define you for the rest of all time. That there are lots of options and openings and opportunities, and it's important, I think, for you not to start out feeling as if that anything you do today determines you in 20, 30, or 40 years' time. And I'd appreciate it if others on the panel might comment on that as well. Erin, how about you? Okay. Um, I joined the Foreign Service straight out of, of college with the uh, Pickering Fellowship, so I knew that upon finishing my graduate degree, I would be indebted to the, the State Department, you could put it that way, for at least four and a half years. And uh, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. It's been an amazing experience. But I'm definitely at a place where now I'm re-evaluating if I think this is a good fit for me. And I think that um, that is kind of, kind of puts me where you guys are. Because I'm sort of also in the same boat of starting to look for new careers and new options that are out there. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that this, in, in our current state, and in, in the way that the world works today, you don't usually keep a job. I mean, some people do, but you don't always keep a job for the rest of your life. And so this is something you're going to be going through in the future, looking for new careers and, and going back out there and starting over, maybe. Um, and I want to bring that up because things like the Foreign Service could be a great career for some of you. And you could be doing it, become an ambassador one day, an assistant secretary, and that's, and that's fabulous. And for some of others of you, it'll be a starting point. It'll be a nice five-year, ten-year career where you learn some great uh, uh, skills that you can use in nonprofit sectors and private sector and other public sector, sector areas. So keep that in mind that you're not making a decision when you graduate here for the rest of your life. It's, it's just a starting point. Will, Will, how about you? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I've had so many different directions in my career since I graduated from college. It, it's just kind of insane. So like I, when I graduated, my first job was at the Blue Gargoyle Youth Service Center, which no longer exists. But I was recruiting students like you to be tutors and mentors to kids in the Chicago public schools. And I thought I was going to be a social worker like my mom. And I went to Barack Obama's campaign kickoff for state senator at the Ramada. Uh, in Hyde Park, uh, fine establishment then as it is now, and um, you know, the next thing I know, I have a clipboard in my hand. I'm going door to door, circulating petitions for him, and you know, I decided to go to graduate school in political science because Michael Dawson had been one of my professors in undergrad, and I was trying to figure out maybe, I, do I want to be a social worker? Do I want? What do I want to do? And he said, just go to graduate school. You can get a PhD, and then the world's your oyster. So I'm in graduate school, and at the same time, I'm working for Barack Obama in his district office, stuffing envelopes, answering phones, sort of doing the intern thing. And eventually, you know, Barack's like, why don't you take a, a year off? You can always go back and finish up and do your dissertation. And uh, that was 13 years ago, and I haven't been back. So, I mean, the idea that you're going to know exactly where you're going to need to be at the age of 22 or 23 and you've locked yourself in, you know, just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would be an alderman in the city of Chicago, I would have laughed at you out loud. There's just no way. I would. I mean, I had spent most of my career in the legislature, right? You know, the, where we, we debate bills and talk about big policy issues. I mean, city council doesn't... It's a very strange job because you're called, you're a member of a council, but you're not really a legislator. You're sort of like a regional lord. Like you, <laughs> I mean, there are literally some wards where it's like, unless you've sort of genuflected and you enter the, the office the appropriate way and bow and, you know, have the right petition, you, you will never see the alderman. Uh, it's different in the fourth ward, obviously. We have a, a, you know, it's more, it's less a ward, more like an anarcho-syndicalist collective with all these <laughs> different groups that I go to and meet with and um, they all have meetings on the same night. So, but, <laughs> but, but what I'm telling you is that, you know, Barbara's dead on and, and I think Aaron had it right too. The, the one thing that's been consistent throughout my career is that whatever job I had, I was gonna do that job as well as I could. I was going to put in the extra effort. I was going to, you know, I wasn't going to sort of promote myself, but I wanted to make sure that if someone gave you an assignment, and, and it's just like when I worked in the legislature, it was the same as it was in the Foreign Service. They may tell you to go stack 10 boxes of something, not because they really need those boxes stacked, but because they want to see if you're going to do it. You know, they may ask you to photocopy committee uh, analyses. They may already have them, but they may want to just see if you're going to follow through on what you're assigned. And the, the challenge for UFC people 
frequently is that you all think that you already have it figured out. Like you are the most, you are the most impressive people who've ever lived on the planet. And you have all the answers. And some things are beneath you. And if you want to succeed in politics, and Prentice is laughing in the back because he works for him, he knows this to be the case. If you're going to succeed in politics, government, whatever sector you're in, you're going to have to do some things that you will think are beneath you. And you'll have to do them as if you think it's the most important thing in the universe. And if you fail to do that, you will fail yourself. So. Thank you, Will. And Rico, want I want to add to this conversation, yeah, please? Uh, uh, Alderman Burns pretty much took my bullet point one, which is don't be too smart. Uh, <laughs> what I mean by that is uh, we're going to take on an intern next term from Rust College. Who's heard of Rust College? Historically black college. Yeah. Uh, we, I also I interview all the interns. And uh, we, get intern we get resumes from uh, universities all over the country. None of you have ever heard of Rust College. You've all heard of Harvard University. Uh, we turned down someone who applied from Harvard, and we're going to take the person from Rust, from Rust College. My, that's my way of saying the same thing, which is congratulations, you're all smart. The University of Chicago at the top of your resume communicates that. If I'm considering hiring you, I need to know I don't think I need to repeat that, that no task is above, uh, below you. Um, at the White House, there's this weird uh, gradation of labor between the world's experts or America's experts on policy who brief the president at the very highest levels and then the 20-somethings. There, there are not a whole lot of people in their 30s and 40s at the White House. It's some of the, most, the best 30-year-olds in the world. Um, but there's a lot of people like me. And, Man, I spent $160,000, or I will over the next 40 years, uh, earning my university degree. Does that prepare me to answer phones? Boy I, boy, I sort of think I'm more qualified to do a whole lot of other things. You're only going to get those chances if you answer those phones well. Um, and there's this great scene from the West Wing. Um, you guys, all right, good. I was hoping I wouldn't have to explain what that was. Uh, <laughs> Josh, Josh Lyman uh, chooses his assistant out for, for getting something that wasn't the assistant's fault. And he said, you want to know how to move on from being an assistant? And an assistant says, yeah. He's like, well, be a really good assistant. Uh, and that's, you know, no one's going to trust you with anything until you, you, uh, you know, suck it up. The president said this perfectly well in the campaign, submerge your own ego. Uh, and that's one of the things he credits with us having a successful campaign was everybody just kept their mind on the future and where this could all be if we all just... David Pluff said the campaign manager, swim in your lane. Whatever your task is, do it. Uh, and don't, don't overreach if you haven't been given the authority to do that. Uh, chain of command uh, is something I don't understand because I uh, never served the military, but it's there in politics as well. Uh, and having the right approval is critical. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're going to see a lot of heads yeah. nod that uh, there are tons of approval processes that um, go into crafting a message or appearing at an event. Um, and the minute you go outside of that, you're in uh, troubled waters, um, which I think leads me to the hardest part about working in public service is uh, what the alderman said, which is being on 24-7. Aaron said the exact same thing. Uh, there are pictures that my friends are taking that I choose to step aside, uh, step aside from. Uh, in our office, we call it the Washington Post test. If what you're doing or what you're saying or what you're emailing appears in the Washington Post on the front page the next day, and you think the president would nod and smile at that or anything else, that tells you whether or not you're doing something good or bad. Um, the other frustrating thing is politics and government is an extraordinary level of mutual trust. The president trusts me with things that, I don't even know if he remembers my name, but he trusts me with an, uh, an extraordinary amount of responsibility for someone my age. Uh, but the opposite is true. My career is in his hands. The minute he says something goofy, uh, I could be out of a job in 11 months. Um, and there are things that I'm sure a lot of people who worked really hard for the Edwards campaign pretty ticked off about the way their boss behaved. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I think in, in government, we, no one's going to blame me for working for a politician who did something bad at a low level. But that just for, that's going to throw me on the street the moment that person says or does something goofy or illegal. So there's an extraordinary amount of trust that goes both ways, even though you don't know each other uh, you know, the president doesn't hear from me on a daily basis by any means, um, but he has to trust me. And thank goodness he does, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's well-placed. So we've had a couple of comments about 
what value a, a college education at the University of Chicago has for people going forward. Phil mentioned that most of the people who are doing sophisticated analysis, that so many of them actually come from a, a University of Chicago background. We've also been told that even though we're the smartest people in the world, we have to disguise it because otherwise <laughs> we're going to have difficulty moving up on a career ladder. I just am curious from the panelists if there's anything else that they'd like to kind of hit on about the value or the lack of value in a, an education from the University of Chicago. Will looks like he's at the ready. I, I, I just will say, to, to all, I'm going to put in a pitch to work in state government, and Barbara can explain why, because it's very similar to Washington. Most of the people who are working in Springfield are in their 20s. I mean, and most of them are downstaters. Um, there are very few U of C grads who are milling about Springfield, but it's a great experience. Um, concomitant with that, you do have to be very, very careful about language. What words you use. If you can use a five cent word as opposed to a 25 cent word, use a five cent word. If you're knocking on someone's door and trying to campaign, you know, don't, don't overwhelm them <laughs> with information. Um, try to make a, an emotional connection with people. Um, and recognize that somebody who went to Western Illinois University may be smarter than you. Um, so they just went to Western. Maybe their family couldn't afford University of Chicago. So there's just a whole bunch of assumptions that I'm not accusing you of having, but it's really important that you don't have when you go out into the world. Anybody else want to add? Erin? Yeah, um, the federal government is a hierarchy. So when you start, you are sitting next to everyone else who's starting. It doesn't really matter that you went to the University of Chicago. It may never actually matter that you went to the University of Chicago in a federal government position. It's all about how well you play the game, how well you play the hierarchy. When you start as a foreign service officer, you sit at a visa window. And you sit there all day, and you interview hundreds of people who want to come to the United States. You are the face of the United States. It is not a fun job. Um, it is long days, people lying to you, people giving you fraudulent documents all day long. And you have to treat them with the utmost respect time and time again. And if you don't, your bosses will remember when you're looking for that job 10 years down the road that you were rude to visa applicants. And you gave people the impression that Americans are rude and do not want them, and you do not want those people in your country. So you have to be ready for hierarchy. They, it does not matter if you have the best idea ever to transform your section. Your boss probably doesn't care and won't listen because you are the, par the person right at the bottom. And until you get that great boss who says, yeah, I'm really interested in what you have to say, which they are rare and hard to come by, you have to wait your turn until you get to a position where you're a supervisor. I'm now a supervisor. It took me three tours, which is not so bad. But I'm not the big boss, so I still have to account to people. I'm still in a hierarchy. Every single letter and email I send out has to be cleared by three people before it leaves my email box. So you got to get ready for, for some bureaucracy and, and pay, you know, paying your dues, basically. But I'm sure Erin is more than willing to listen to suggestions from all those people she supervises, right. unlike yeah. her bosses, right? <laughs> right. Yes. right? Okay, Rico, do you want to add to this? In high school, they ask you the question, what is democracy? And you're right when you say, it's when people vote, and your teacher nods. That's good, that's good. At the University of Chicago, I remember coming in and feeling very excited about coming to the university, and I think the professor said something like, what is democracy? And there was silence in the classroom. I'm like, do they not know what it is? <laughs> you know? <laughs> But, I mean, you guys are laughing because you know that when you're in a social class, someone says, it's when people vote. And the professor's like, what do you mean by people? <laughs> what, do you, what, do you mean by, what do you mean by vote? And I think that was like just a jarring experience. I'm like, it's when you go to the polls. And then, you know, I, I find myself using that same, you're going to hear it again, you learn critical thinking at this university. But when I, I work in a factory, paper letters in, paper letters out, <laughs> phone calls. When someone comes into my office and I sent them on a mission and they come back and they say, the process is 15% more efficient, I say, what's efficient mean? <laughs> you know, are you just cutting corners? So the value, of, the value of that education for me has been just not doubting everything everybody says, but um, just being skeptical. inquisitive, being skeptical. Yeah. Um, wanting to know that you have the best information before you make a, uh, a judgment that's going to have impacts that might be hard to reverse later on um, and that is going to outlive you probably because a lot of what we do in the government is based on lessons we've learned from previous administrations or um, the people that came before us. Thank you. And Phil, would you like to add? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, a University of Chicago education could be like an affliction 
because invariably when you're working for the government, you're in a big bureaucracy, and you'll have some idiot in the front of the room, well, I'm not being personal here, <laughs> but um, who will say something totally off the wall. And it'll, it'll be the University of Chicago guy in the back of the room who'll say, but that's not quite right. Whereas everybody else in the room is biting their tongue and kind of looking into the corners of the room. So the, the University of Chicago thing comes out at unfortunate moments. <laughs> and, and in a big bureaucracy, it's, it, you, know, you have to learn at a certain point that um, you have to control it. <laughs> Great. So I, we're now ready to hear from you to hear your questions instead of asking our own. And Dylan, do people have to go there or can they just w raise their hand? I hear it. Yeah, no, I think people can actually. Yeah, okay. So start raising your hands and you cannot all ask about what it's like to be in the CIA. You have to ask questions that are relevant to the other experiences that the panel brings to this discussion. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. One for. Um, do, you, do you want to tell us your name? Hi, I'm Olivia. Uh, one question for. And my other question is more generally, which is that you especially have left government to work in nonprofit sector and you all kind of touch on the difficulties of working in, in government. But I was especially curious as to like, despite all of the, the temptations to leave, what is it that makes you stay? Okay, but well, do you want to start with? with, with sure, the, uh, the difference between politics and government. What is government? <laughs> How do I begin to answer this question? Um, I don't know if I've thought about it too much, but basically, the government is the public trust, and public means everyone. Um, politics means the people who agree with you right now to accomplish something or to uh, press the government or to air certain grievances. Uh, and the best way to sort of distinguish between the two, I mean, I always say to our new interns, uh, the moment you're using a public resource for a partisan reason, you're in big trouble. Uh, you know, not every taxpayer signs up for policy X, but the moment you're using the dime they sent you to accomplish policy X in a partisan way, you're uh, abusing the trust that's been put into you. So, um, you know, I think you'll, you'll notice it if you watch the kinds of things that Jay Carney says, the press secretary, on a day-to-day -day basis versus the kind of things that the campaign says, and that'll help you understand what is the difference between politics and government. Um, whether, uh, you know, 47% of the American people did not vote for the president, I shouldn't say that, voted against, the, or voted for John McCain, but we're, we govern 100% of Americans, and you have to keep that in mind absolutely every single day. There are many uh, times in our office where people will propose ideas or policies that, um, you know, we should have our letters say this or that, and I say, well, how is someone who's writing, who has opposed the president on this issue, going to read that letter? You have to step into their mind, and that's something that, you know, unfortunately, in the current political climate, there's all of this talking to your own people. Um, but from the office that we're in, we're receiving a letter from an inmate threatening the president. The next letter is a single mom down on her luck asking for help. The next letter is a handwritten note from Bill Gates thanking the president for visiting his office. You know, it's just the widest range of, of things. Um, politics should be the same way. It should be the, that we're all talking to each other and people we disagree with. Um, but government is by definition that, or at least it should be. And, and, I, and I, I think the, the point you're making really needs to be underscored, and that is that if you are acting as if you are, for example, out there collecting signatures to put somebody's name on the ballot, and you're doing that on government time, that's illegal, immoral, and if not fattening, it certainly should be. So it's really thinking about, you really have to think about, is this part of my government responsibility, or am I acting uh, in a political fashion? Um, you asked also about bureaucracies, and I guess I'd, I'd like to hear from the, the, the people who have worked in the, in the federal bureaucracies at the state level. We certainly have lots of bureaucracy too, but from my perspective as, perspective as an elected official, that doesn't discourage me from trying to push the bureaucracy, from trying to uh, adopt laws that will make the bureaucracy behave in a more responsive, more efficient, and more effective uh, manner, and I, you may want to add to that too. Well, well there are two things. One, one, one thing I would say is that there's a critical distinction between being staff or part of the government or being elected as a leader in the government. And, um, you know, I, I think a few years ago I'd reached my shelf life in terms of being a staffer. Like, I was like, this, I'm done with this. I can't, I'd reach a point 
um, like some of the folks on this panel, where it's like, okay, I've done my bit, I've learned about the state government, I think I'm ready to go on and do something else. And at that point, I was asked to run for state representative. And then I thought to myself, wow, it would be really cool to actually be the guy speaking into the microphone instead of writing the speech as someone else mangled. Um, <laughs> which happens, you'll write like this really right. eloquent line, and some legislator will muffle it on the, the floor, or you tell them the answer to the question, and they, they're so like, long. what? I don't get it. And you're like, wait, wait, step away from the microphone. Because in floor debate, in floor debate, you know, anyone can stand up and ask you a question about your bill. And it's your job as a staff who worked on the bill to stand next to, now Barbara didn't anyone stand next to her. I just, just, let's be clear That's about that. That's because I went to the University of Chicago. Exactly. <laughs> but, but there are others where, you know, you're like, okay, this bill amends this section of the school code. And they, and they literally are repeating exactly what you're whispering in, in their ear. And that gets really annoying. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there's, a, there's a huge difference when you become elected because now you're the actor. And you get to, and that's different too because now you have to decide what name you're gonna, are you gonna put your name on this bill? Where are you gonna vote? How do you, are you representing your constituency or are you leading your constituency to a different position? I mean, it, it's a, it, but it's a lot of fun because it's your name, it's your choice, you become, sort of an actor in that space. You ask me why I stay in government, why I do it. Um, a, they give you a badge if you're an alderman. Um, <laughs> under Illinois you can law. Carry a gun, I can I carry say. a gun. I do oh. have a. <laughs> don't show I do, us. We I don't do have a go. badge do not um, like that Virginia is given to me by the city of Chicago. <laughs> under, under Illinois law, aldermen are um, oh, pre <laughs> preservers, <laughs> conservators of the peace. Uh, I have arrest powers, um, and I can carry a gun, and I'm an elected official, which is awesome. <laughs> but the, the, the second reason why I, I like doing it yesterday, and I don't get many opportunities where there's a clear, bright line between something that's good and something that's evil. And I was in a meeting with a guy who owns a building where there's this liquor store where literally you can walk inside and buy marijuana and heroin and God knows what else, along with malt liquor, if you're so inclined. You can. <laughs> One-stop shopping, we want to make it convenient for consumers. So I've launched a series of hearings to close this place down. So the guy who owns the store and the guy who owns the building come to my office, they want to, they want parlay or something. So I had people who want this store shut down, community residents, give them the reasons why, and then they're talking and they're trying to make their arguments. And I explained, no, I sent a guy into your store today and he bought a bag of weed. He brought it back for me along with his old English 800. There's something clearly wrong with your store. And so the guy who owns a building is like, I don't understand you, Alderman. You wouldn't let us bring a cash for gold into the, into the, into the ward, into the building. They'd have been a great tenant. And I slapped the table as hard as I humanly could. I mean, it was a big, I slapped the table and said, I didn't get elected alderman of the fourth ward to bring in cash for gold or liquor stores that sell drugs and that make our community a hard place to do business in and that poison our people. So I don't know who you thought you were talking to, but I'm not that guy. And then I quoted Shakespeare, which was really funny. <laughs> So I said, you know, as the conspirators are gathering around Caesar, they, they ask him if he'll allow someone to return from banishment. And he says, if tears could move me, I would be so moved, but I am constant as the northern star. Gentlemen, my path is clear. Get out of my office. That was fun. So anyway, that's why I stay in government. <laughs> And Aaron, Aaron and Phil, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't know how I can follow that. Okay, um, well, our job's not quite as glamorous, but there, are, there have been a few moments where I definitely um, have realized why I stay. I mean, when you're reuniting an abducted child with their parent who hasn't seen the child in three years and uh, the child was abducted by the, the father, when you uh, give a visa to a student and you, you know that you're just taking her out of perhaps a, a poverty-filled home in, in rural Nigeria and giving her a visa to attend Howard University and you know that her life will forever be changed. Um, in Bolivia, when you're talking to a, 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 a member of the Bolivian legislature who says, begins the conversation with, down with America, you, you guys are terrible, and by the end is telling me, you know what, I, I think there might be some good things and some good things about the United States. Um, these are the moments when you realize 
that what you're doing is making an impact. And, and the things you get to do in your free time. Um, we, we rebuilt a women's shelter in Bolivia for victims of, of domestic violence. We, we uh, took um, these teenage victims of sexual trafficking who were as young as nine years old to see Justin Bieber in 3D. I mean, <laughs> that was one of the highlights of my life. They had never been on escalators. We didn't even need the movie. We could have just taken them on the escalators all day. It was like, it was great. I mean, to see their faces, those are the kind of moments when you realize that you're bringing with you the United States and you are the face of the United States. You're helping to bring families back together and, and doing good work, so. Great, Phil? <clears throat> well, on the intelligence side, there, you know, you have some tremendous highs when you have a successful operation. Um, you're sitting across the table from a, a member of a terrorist group, and he's agreed to provide you information on his group. Um, it, it's, it's a great emotional high. Um, there are other things that obviously that aren't in the media very much about uh, uh, accomplishments um, in intelligence operations overseas. Um, these things can be uh, very positive, but I would say on balance that um, people stay in jobs because the, the good things they get out of it outweigh the bad things. And when it reaches a tipping point, when suddenly it's not uh, that way anymore, you just move on. And I think one of the messages we've had today is that, you know, people change jobs all the time, and people change direction all the time. And I think it's, there's nothing unhealthy in that. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, w uh, when you're in a job for a, a number of years, you have status, you have uh, a high salary, you have a lot of things that encourage you to stay with the job. But eventually these things are, are perhaps not as important as the other intangibles. So uh, I, I think it's, a, it's healthy that we're talking in terms of, of, of people changing jobs and moving on and doing different things. Great, thank you. Next, next question, you certainly had us going in there, Olivia, with what seemed like a simple, straightforward question. <laughs> so let's have briefer questions, or maybe briefer answers. Sorry, yes. I, I like I've got a very brief question that um, I can't imagine isn't on anybody's mind for Phil, and that's on a scale of one to 007. How exciting <laughs> was uh, working in the CIA? <laughs> There were exciting days and there were non-exciting days. They, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's like, uh, I, I think the description of the Army during the Second World War was that it was hurry up and wait, and 99.9% .9 of your time you'd be just sitting somewhere. And that's the way it was in uh, intelligence operations too. Something, something happens and then you're very, very busy for a short period of time. And, and uh, it, it's exhilarating when that happens. It's if you're into the thrill aspect of of, of uh, what intelligence operations uh, sometimes develop. Uh, that's what it's all about. That's the James Bond stuff. But most of the time, you're a bureaucrat, and, and it can get pretty boring. Yes. Um, well, I have well, two questions that are interrelated, sort of related. This has to do with like, the sort of choice between either law, law school or mm -hmm. doing political science. From your experiences, why are most elected officials seemingly lawyers? Mm -hmm. And two, like, what kinds of jobs would be open for someone who got a, like, a degree in political science, like, sort of right after grad school? Mm -hmm. Well, but it, it, the two elected officials sitting on this panel, neither one of us is a lawyer. And I thought about, I mean, law, but my husband was a lawyer, and I thought one in the family is enough, and he actually taught law, and I thought making the law was a much more interesting thing to do than just teaching about it. Uh, so I, I thought that what I did in political science, in fact, I was doing a degree in political science. I was working on a PhD when I decided to, to uh, give up um, uh, political theory and do a real politique. And I found that having a, having a uh, I didn't finish my PhD just as Will didn't finish his, but I did have a master's degree in political science and I think that's not a bad background at all, not only for being in a, a legislative body, but also for being the kind of staff that, that Will was earlier talking about, the people who are involved in the Department of Children and Family Services or the Department of Revenue. A lot of those people have degrees in economics or in law. Many of them are, not, or in political science, many of them are not lawyers. So I don't think there's anything that says if you're going to do law, that gives you a leg up when it comes to running for public office, at least not today. Used to be, I think, that there were a much higher per a percentage of people who had law degrees in in legislatures, and that's much less true today than it was 20 years ago. I also think you have to you have to consider the economics of it too. So, 
you know, when you get a law school degree, you're talking about a significant amount of debt, which limits you in terms of the jobs you can take, which would help you to become an elected official, right? So um, that's part of the calculus that you have to think about as well, because, I mean, state representatives, the starting salary for a state rep is 65000 um, st starting salary for an alderman is r around 110, um, but you know, a lot of times you know those are it's difficult to make and it doesn't that also may sound like a lot of money, but it's it's really not if you've got kids and you've got to live in the city of Chicago and mortgages and so those are all things to consider. More questions? Can can I just add one thing oh, on please, that? Please, please, Erin. Sorry, I, we've been talking about the foreign service. The, the Department of State, of course, has a civil service as well. And for those people that are more analytically inclined or have interest in a very specific or narrow topic, such as uh, trafficking of persons or a specific region or intelligence from the State Department point of view, uh, there are positions that are always available in D.C. as on the analyst side or on a specific area. So you could, uh, if you had a degree in political science or something specific within it, that is where that would benefit you in the civil service of the, of the State Department. In the Foreign Service, you're educate, you only need a high school degree to be a Foreign Service officer. So the education a aspect isn't as important. But for the civil service, that definitely gives you the leg up. Okay, good. Yes, you had a... I saw a hand back there. Yes, you. Uh, what can we do to make the most of our undergraduate experience? All right. Rico, Rico's going to take that one. Um, Tell me DUT. Huh? Tell me DUT. DUT. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much going to say that one is be involved yeah. on campus. If your dream is to be the executive director of a think tank that deals with Russian affairs, that's gonna to go to the person who knows how to run a conference call, knows how to run a meeting, knows how to talk in front of people. It's not gonna to go to the person that knows the most about Russia. The only, the, one of the unfortunate things about the way we prepare people for the real world in academia is the person who you know, knows the most about this issue gets the best grade. At least that's how you know, high school goes a lot of the time. Um, so you gotta be involved on campus. Model UN is what I did, uh, and a CIA recruiter came to our Model UN meeting and said, you do exactly what we do you know, please apply to the CIA. Um, so be involved on campus. Two, take the hardest classes you possibly can. I know a lot of people who tailor their, their college experience to get the best GPA, and they did fine. Um, but there are many times where I thank God that I took elementary logic, even though I did awfully in that class. Uh, Little Red Schoolhouse, um, you're gonna go out into a world where people don't know how to write a clear email. It's awful, but you have this opportunity right now to take that class and be launched into the top 10, five, one half of 1% clearest writers in the world. You cannot go graduate without taking that class, uh, even if it's, a, if, if it's a tough class. Don't, if you took, if you took Spanish and you moved and you lived there, you know, you lived in Spain for 10 years and you take Spanish so you can bump up your GPA, you're really missing out on this. Uh, my family, you know, took out a whole lot of loans for me to have this education, and that was a signal to me that I better take advantage of the education part of it, not run up my GPA. So, you know, I took strategy with PAPE, even though I knew that that was 200 pages a week just for that class. Um, Mearsheimer's not famous for being an easy grader, but man, did those classes change the way I think about the world. Um, so don't worry about your GPA, especially if you want to work on a political campaign, I want to know if you know how to knock the right door and say the right thing. I don't really, I really don't care what your GPA is. I know above a certain level, it's going to be different for civil service positions when you're applying and your application is one of a hundred. But if you just walk into your local elected official's office and say, "Can I knock some doors for you?" They're not going to turn you away. Uh, so that's your door. That's your foot in the door, and your GPA is irrelevant for that opportunity. Anybody else, Aaron? Because um, you made some points about, about yeah. resume building, not in terms of GPA, but in terms of activities, in terms of internships mm -hmm. and uh, showing a commitment to the community, volunteerism, and so forth. Maybe you want to expand on that. For the Foreign Service, uh, your academics are not as important. So I suggest you take the classes you want to take, have fun with it, enjoy it. Languages are really important, um, not because it helps you get in, but take it from me, someone who had no languages, when I took my six-month fluency course in Spanish and got off the plane, I had no idea what anybody was saying. So it would have been helpful had I actually learned Spanish before 
I joined the Foreign Service. You know, those are those are elements that can help you. But other than that, really for the Foreign Service aspect, it, it's having fun with your free time, good internships, good jobs. I worked in the Fourth Ward actually when I was uh, when I was at the University of Chicago through Neighborhood Schools Program, um, working at different. You know, just have fun with it. Have different experiences. Uh, summer links. Um, doing all the UCSC work, neighborhood schools program, all those kinds of things are great. And, and that's really what makes you stand out during the interview for the Foreign Service. Will? I, I, I'll just say a couple of quick things. Um, if you're interested in working on partisan staff in Springfield, um, so there's Republican staff, uh, Democratic staff, House and Senate, it, be, it behooves you to have spent some time with the college Republicans or the college Democrats and have that on your resume. Um, if you want to be an elected official, you should do theater. Showbiz, that's what go, it's all about. Go do, go volu go do UT um, and learn how to tell a story um, because it's not about you know, being right or demonstrating it. It's about creating a narrative that people believe in that makes them feel better about themselves and makes them feel that you know, dragging themselves to the polls is actually going to make a difference in the world in which they live. Um, so do that. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck. Okay. Phil, anything to add? Yeah, just very briefly, and in, in, certainly in the intelligence community, there's a uh, there's a bias against people who are too smart, and uh, this is pervasive throughout the community, both on the military side and on the uh, civilian side. Um, but that said, University of Chicago people are very highly respected because Gen University of Chicago people are generally regarded as generalists. No matter what you majored in, you took courses in a lot of different subjects, and you know about a lot of different things. So I think it's a it's a big plus in terms of. Um, the UC degree in terms of trying to get into an intelligence profession. Thank you. For the questions, we have time for a few more. Yes, Andrea. I, guess I have a question uh, just about working in politics in general. Um, what is it like working with people who have very, like with the public having very high expectations for the amount of changes you can make and kind of dealing with the criticisms that come from the reality of you can't do that? Yeah, well, I, I would say this. When I first went to Springfield, I was a, you know, a radical revolutionary and I was going to change the world. I discovered that the most important part of my resume for being a state legislator was having been the mother of a two-year-old. Because if you are the mother of a two-year-old, you develop a very strong tolerance for frustration. And you, <laughs> and you understand that one step forward generally then means two steps back. So yes, it is difficult to deal with people's expectations and hopes that you're there and you will change the world, but the reality is our system of government is not based on the idea that everything is going to turn over in a minute and a half. We have checks and balances, we have three different branches of government, even within the legislative branch, it isn't just a house, it's also a Senate. So the, the whole model is one that says change happens slowly, if at all, so I think that it becomes important for people to explain to the constituency that there are other, other actors, other actresses, other problems that mean that you can't change, you can't build Rome in a day. And Will, do you want to add to that? I, I think sometimes people just say things to you to, to because they can. Um, <laughs> because you know, they pay your salary. I mean, I've had people say that to me, and, and they may be upset about something they read in a Tribune editorial. It's normally caused by the Chicago Tribune, in my experience. <laughs> yes, mine um, too. You know, <laughs> and, and so, you, and the key is your reaction. You know, you accept the fact that no matter how hard you work, there's gonna be somebody who's gonna be dissatisfied with you or just dissatisfied with life, and it may have nothing to do with you whatsoever. And so you, you listen politely and say thank you and, and move on, or you have a response or an angry email or letter, and. You know, and, and you just suck it up. Your dad's a great guy, by the way. I, I enjoyed working with him in Springfield. Yeah. He speaks uh, highly of you. Rico. Uh, the, following, the following story is not true, but when I write a political sitcom, I'm gonna make it true. Before we all break and go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, we all brief each other on what we've accomplished because when we go back to that Thanksgiving table and my uncle who's a small business owner said, you do nothing for small businesses, I can say, excuse me, I've got a fact sheet <laughs> with me. It's my way of saying, if you just keep a journal, if you're working hard and you're doing the best you can, you're gonna have successes and it's so easy, to, when, they, when they pile up, it's so easy to forget them. I really enjoy when the president is asked on 60 Minutes, why do you deserve another term? And he just rifles off all of the things that have happened. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, is it, you know, change we can believe in, you know, the, that we all bought into? I don't know, for me it is. Um, but 
it's really hard to do. And the moment you start ticking off all of the things, don't you remember I did this? And don't you remember when that happened, we did this? And don't you remember this? People start to nod. He's like, oh yeah, you are, you are doing the best you can. So keeping a journal of your accomplishments uh, is something that every elected official would be well served uh, by making sure their staff, when they go home for break, have. And reading it on a daily basis just to remind yourself of all the good things you've done. So is there, a, we, we have time for another question. Do I see any eager hand raised? I, yeah, I do. No, no. I don't think so. <laughs> but I'm pleased to make his acquaintance today. I was a young Republican then. <laughs> and I was, of course, a Democrat. What can I tell you? I, Rico. I, I have a quick question I was expecting you all to ask for the rest of the panel, which is, are there any cautionary tales about building your resume that preclude you from other opportunities? Namely, uh, I know that the international aid community is suspicious of intelligence. I know that uh, if you've got Republican political experience all over your resume, a Democratic office might not take a quick look at it. Do you have any experience uh, with you know, experiences like that where if uh, my resume probably has too much blue on it to be considered uh, for a you know, less partisan position. Um, so I wonder if you have examples of that. I don't think I have any examples of that. And again, if you're talking government work, I think one would be uh, loath to say, well, we can't hire Rico because if I'm a Republican because he had all that blue on his record. So you know, there are some ways in which some things that might look a disadvantage in a time when everybody wants to make sure that the distinction between government and politics is very clearly drawn might not be quite so harmful. So I don't, do you have any uh, examples? Well, I, I yeah, would, Phil. yeah, your, your resume can close you out. There's no question about it. It depends on what it, how it reads. Uh, I would say that uh, um, I know certainly when I work on my own resume, I have several resumes for different purposes. I'm sure everyone does. Mm -hmm. and, and what you try to do is you try to uh, depoliticize uh, what positions you've had and what you've done. You, you emphasize your, the skills and the, and the access and the, and the abilities that you developed in, in the position, and you de-emphasize the political aspect of it because ultimately we're, we're really not political players. I think everybody at this table, we're trying to do within our own spheres what's best for the United States and for its people. And uh, so I think ultimately if you come down in terms of your, your skills and your interests and everything like that, and, and not play the political ball too much, uh, uh, you're, you're going to be fine. A great final question and a great final answer. So my job now is to thank the panelists. I think everyone's been really interesting and helpful, and certainly to thank all of you for coming to spend a Saturday thinking about what's in your future, and I wish you all the very best. Thanks. Thanks.